Question 1. Which inequality gives the domain of y equals the square root of 2x minus 3? Now what's inside the square root must be greater than or equal to 0. That means 2x minus 3 must be greater than or equal to 0. So solving this inequality, so I'm making x the subject of this inequality, we'll add 3 to both sides. So no need to switch the inequality sign. So we have 2x is greater than or equal to 3. And then dividing both sides of the inequality by 2, we have x is greater than or equal to 3 over 2. So therefore, answer is option D. Question 2. The function f of x equals x cubed is transformed to g of x equals x minus 2 or cubed plus 5 by a horizontal translation of 2 units followed by a vertical translation of 5 units. Which row of the table shows the directions of the translations? Consider the function y equals x cubed. Its graph is a cubic curve that passes through the origin. Next, we'll consider the vertical and the horizontal translations in isolation. Now y equals x cubed plus 5 has the effect of moving the curve upward by 5 units. And we can think of this plus 5 here as adding 5 to all the y coordinates on this curve. y equals x minus 2 all cubed moves the curve to the right 2 units. And we can find that by solving the equation x minus 2 equals 0 and x equals 2. So that's a horizontal translation to the right of 2 units. And if we combine the two of course, we get the curve moving upward by 5 and then to the right by 2. So the answer is option B. Question 3. John recently did a class test in each of three subjects. The class scores on each test were normally distributed. The table shows the subjects and John's scores as well as the mean and standard deviation of the class scores on each test. Relative to the rest of the class, which row of the table below shows John's strongest subject and his weakest subject? Since class scores were normally distributed, Z scores can be used to determine John's relative performance in each subject. So John's Z score for French is equal to John's raw score minus the mean for French divided by the standard deviation for French, and that equals positive one. The Z score for commerce is equal to 80 minus 65 divided by five, and that equals positive 3, and the Z score for music is equal to 74 minus 50 divided by 12, which is equal to positive 2. So John's strongest subject, relatively speaking, is commerce, and John's weakest subject was French. So the answer is option A. Question 4. What is the indefinite integral of e plus e to the power of 3x dx? Consider the integrand one term at a time. e is a non-zero constant. So the integral of e with respect to x is e multiplied by x plus c. To check that result, you can differentiate the right-hand side. So the derivative of plus c is just zero, so the c disappears. And the derivative of e multiplied by x with respect to x the x disappears and we're left with e. The integral of e to the power of 3x is just e to the power of 3x divided by 3 or multiplied by 1 third plus some constant c. We can check that result by differentiating the right hand side and the derivative of 1 third multiplied by e to the power of 3x plus c is just e to the power of 3x. So combining these two results, the integral of e plus e to the power of 3x with respect to x is ex plus one third multiplied by e to the power of 3x plus some constant c. So therefore, the answer is option B. Question five. Which of the following could represent the graph of y equals negative x squared plus bx plus one, where b is greater than zero? Firstly, the coefficient of the leading term x squared is negative. So the parabola is concave down. That means the answers are the options C or D. Next, we need to determine whether the vertex of the parabola lies to the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the y-axis. And we can use the formula x equals negative b on 2a to help determine that. And in this case, x equals negative b over 2 times negative 1, negative 1 being the coefficient of the leading term, and that equals b over 2. 
but B is greater than zero, so the vertex is to the right of the y-axis. So therefore the answer is option C. Question six. Which interval gives the range of the function y equals five plus two cos three x? Consider the function y equals cos three x. The three x compresses the curve horizontally by a factor of three, but it has no effect on the range. The range of cos three x is still from negative one to one. So if it's set up as an inequality, if we multiply cos three x by two, that dilates the curve or amplifies the curve by a factor of two. So instead of the range being from negative one to one, the range will be from negative two to positive two. So multiplying each of the terms of this inequality by two, we can see what happens. We end up with the range being from negative two to positive two for the function two cos three x. Next, we'll add five to this function. So that translates the curve upwards by five units. So adding five to each of the terms of this inequality, we get negative two plus five, which equals three. Two cos three x plus five is just five plus two cos three x, which is the function in the question. And two plus five is equal to seven. So the range is between three and seven, including the endpoints. So the answer is option B. Question seven. The diagram shows the graph of y equals function x which is made up of line segments and a semicircle. What is the value of the integral from zero to 12 of f of x dx? The question is asking for the value of a definite integral, not the area bounded between the curve and the x-axis. So that means we need to take into account whether the areas are positive or negative. So in this instance, this area here and this area here will cancel since the two areas are identical but opposite in sign. So this positive area here will cancel with this negative area here. So there's only two regions we need to consider. This region here, A1, and that's just a rectangle, and then region A2, which is a semicircle. So region A1 is just eight times three, which is 24, and region A2, area of a semicircle, is half pi r squared, so that's equal to half times pi, times two squared, and that's why I just wrote the six there, just to make it clear that the radius here is two units, and that's equal to two pi. So the answer is option A, 24 plus two pi. The graph of y equals function x is shown. Which of the following inequalities is correct? Assuming the graph is drawn to scale, the y-coordinate of this point is around 1.3. So the horizontal distance is one centimeter and the vertical distance, so the distance from the x-axis to the point is around 1.3. So f of one is approximately 1.3. Now the value of the gradient of the tangent to the curve at this point is approximately one. So that was just done by inspection. And the value of the second derivative at this point are found by analyzing the gradient of the tangent at some point to the left of one, of the point where x equals one, and some point to the right of x equals one. And I found that the gradient of the tangent decreased as we went from left to right. So that means the second derivative at this point must be negative. Therefore, the second derivative at x equals one is less than zero, which is less than the first derivative at x equals one, which is less than the value of the function at x equals one. So therefore the answer is option A. Question nine. Suppose the weight of melons is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. A melon has a weight below the lower quartile of the distribution, but not in the bottom 10% of the distribution. Which of the following most accurately represents the region in which the weight of this melon lies? Referring to the empirical rule, mu minus sigma corresponds to a Z score of negative one, which corresponds to the lower 16% of the normal distribution. But we're told that the melon weight lies somewhere in the bottom 25% or the lower quartile. Hence, the melon weight has a maximum Z score somewhere between negative one and zero. 
Now mu minus two sigma corresponds to a Z score of negative two, which corresponds to the lower two and a half percent of the normal distribution. But we're told that the melon weight is not in the bottom 10% of the distribution. Hence the melon weight has a minimum Z score somewhere between negative two and negative one. Therefore, the answer is option C. Question 10. The graph shows two functions, y equals f of x and y equals g of x. Define h of x equals f of g of x. How many stationary points does y equal h of x have for x greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 5? h of x equals f of g of x, which is a composite function. And to differentiate composite functions, the chain rule needs to be applied. h dash of x is equal to the derivative of f of g of x, which is equal to the derivative of the outer function, which is f dash of g of x, multiplied by the derivative of the inner function, which is g dash of x. Now to find the stationary points, we let h dash of x equal zero. And that occurs when either f dash of g of x equals zero, so that term of the product, or g dash of x equals zero, this term of the product. So either one of those two has to equal zero. So we'll consider both cases, case one and case two. Consider case one, where f dash of g of x equals zero. If we go back to the original graph, let's have a look at y equals f of x. And we can see that there's a stationary point that occurs when x equals one. In other words, f dash of one equals zero. So going back to case one, f dash of one equals zero implies that g of x must equal one. After all, it's f dash of g of x equals zero and g of x must equal 1, since that's where the stationary point occurs. Now, where does g of x equal 1? And that occurs twice in the domain x between 1 and 5. So if we go back to the original graph, I've marked that in. So g of x equals 1 here and here. And it's f dash of 1 is where the stationary point occurs on the curve y equals f of x. So two stationary points occur there. Now let's look at case number two, g dash of x equals zero, and that one's straightforward, and that occurs at x equals three. So if we go back to the graph, y equals g of x, so g dash of x equals zero at this point at the vertex of the parabola. So that's where the third stationary point occurs. Hence, h of x has three stationary points, and therefore the answer is option D. Question one. Which of the following could represent the graph of y equals negative x squared plus one? So let's have a look at the options quickly. Option A, that's a straight line. This one is in the form y equals mx plus c. C is the y-intercept and m is the gradient. Okay. Let's look at part B. Okay, a graph that starts sort of from the left-hand side, very close to the x-axis, very sort of very low or very, very small value rising up, going through one on the y-axis, and then rising at a, at a very sharp rate on the right-hand side there, this one is an exponential function. So this one's really of the form y equals uh, a to the power of x, where uh, a is in fact uh, a number greater than one. Okay, so this one's an exponential. Part C, okay, sort of a U-shape, okay, that's a parabola. This one's concave down, so that means that there's a negative involved, okay? This one is of the form y equals ax squared plus c. Now, the value of a here determines whether it's concave up or concave down. So in this case, okay, it's concave down, so it's actually gonna be a negative number, okay? So it's actually negative x squared plus c. C is the y-intercept, and we can see that the y-intercept here is one. So it's y equals negative x squared plus one. So it's option C. But let's have a look at option D um, just for completeness. Uh, this one, a graph that sort of has two branches there um, that sort of gets close to the y-axis, doesn't quite touch it, or gets close to the x-axis, but doesn't quite touch it. So we call that asymptotic or um, uh, sort of approaching an asymptote. This one is a hyperbola, okay? And this one's of the form y equals k on x. Okay, so you might recall having seen these. So it's option C. 
Question two, what is 0 0.002073 expressed in standard form with two significant figures? So I'm gonna show you two different ways of doing this. Standard form just means scientific notation. So that's times, you know, sort of this number times 10 to the power of something. Let's do it without a calculator first. What we need to do is just move the decimal point a certain number of places, actually move it enough um, places so that it's in, in front of the first non-zero number. So that's in front of the two here. So what we're gonna do is going to, just gonna write the number first. So it's, it's good to learn some of these non-calculator strategies. Okay, so we're gonna move it one, two, three. So three places. And so we're gonna write the number with the um, decimal point now um, that's been moved, um, which is now gonna be 2.073. Okay, let me move the decimal point there. Multiplied by 10. Now, because we're making a very small number or, or a small number into a bigger number, okay, 0 0.002 is much smaller than 2.073, uh, we need to put a minus sign in front. And the number that you put um, behind the minus sign uh, corresponds to the number of places you've moved um, the decimal point. So one, two, three, done, okay? Now, we haven't quite answered the question. Uh, we still need two significant figures. So now we need to round um, our answer or our, our, our number in scientific notation. Two significant figures mean starting from the first non-zero digit, which obviously here is the two, um, so it's going to be 2.0 or 2.1. So what I like to do is I just like to underline the numbers that I want, the significant numbers, which means they're the important numbers. Okay, so that's going to be 2 point. Now, uh, the zero either stays as a zero or becomes a one depending on the number um, behind it. So the number behind um, is a seven, which means that the zero must become a one. We then ignore the seven and the three. We don't need to worry about those. Times 10 to the power of negative three. So that's gonna be option D. Okay, so 2.1 times 10 to the negative three. Now, how could we do this using a calculator? Your calculator can do uh, sort of work in scientific notation uh, and also um, round to a certain number of significant figures as well. So what we'll do, uh, I'll just move the number there, uh, make sure that number's visible. First of all, uh, mode, um, actually, it's a shift setup and well, it's actually the mode key, but we have got to press shift first. Number seven, or at least on this calculator, it's number seven, um, SCI, so that means scientific notation. So push that. Now, the next question that it asks you is how many, des well, how many significant figures, sorry, um, that you would like, and then you want two significant figures. So press two. Now type in the number, 0 0.002073, and there's your answer, 2.1 times 10 to the negative three. So very nice. The one thing that you need to remember to do is to take it back out of that mode. Um, there's two ways of doing that. Probably the fail safe way of doing that is do a factory reset on the calculator. So shift number nine, clear all, reset all. So just follow, basically follow the prompts, equals, and we're back out of that um, SCI mode. Question three, the distance between Bricktown and Koala Creek is 75 kilometers. A person travels from Bricktown to Koala Creek at an average speed of 50 kilometers per hour. How long does it take the person to complete the journey? So this is a question that relates to uh, distance, speed, and time. And you probably might have seen this before. Remember the, well, if you haven't seen it, well, a uh, good way to sort of introduce it, I guess. Distance, speed, and time. You might have seen this triangle before. So what this means is that distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. So we want how long, so this means that we want time. So the way this works is if you cover the T, okay, so imagine you cover the T, uh, T is equal to distance over speed. Okay, so time is equal to distance over speed. Now the distance is 75 kilometers over a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. Okay, so 75 divided by 50, and we get 1.5. Okay, and 1.5 hours means one hour and 30 minutes. Okay, so it's gonna be option C. Question four, Joan invests $200. She earns interest at 3% per annum, compounded monthly. What is the future value of Joan's investment after 1.5 years. So 
This is a lump sum investment, so just investing sort of a bit of money all at the beginning. This is the future value formula. So future value is equal to present value multiplied by one plus R, the interest rate per period, to the power of N, which is the number of periods. Now, PV, so that's the present value is 200. One plus, now what's the interest rate? Interest rate's 3% per annum. So let's write down 3%, but it's compounded monthly which means that we need to divide that by 12. Okay, and it's for 1.5 years. Now, is that to the power of 1.5? Now, just be very careful here. Initially, it might appear so, but it's compounded monthly. So I would probably underline that, make sure you know, you're clear on that. There are 12 months in a year, all right, 1.5 years. Okay, if you times that by 12, you've got 18 compounding periods in total. Okay, so always remember it's interest rate per period to the power of the number of periods in total. And in 1.5 years, um, there are 18 compounding periods. All right, entering, entering in all of that into the calculator. Okay, one plus R. So you can actually type it in as is. That's the, that's the beauty of these calculators. They're, um, you know, they're really versatile um, in this way. So power of 18 and we get 209 dollars and 19 cents and that would be option b question six suppose y equals negative one minus two x when the value of x increases by five the value of y decreases by give me some options there so i think the first thing to notice is that the the equation really is in the form y equals mx plus c okay in fact i might just rewrite it a little bit differently here I'm just going to rearrange it, just so you can see what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to put the negative 2x first, and then minus 1. So the gradient's negative 2. So what does the gradient represent here, or what does it mean in, in, what, in terms of the, the values of x and y, or that relationship between x and y? Negative 2, this gradient means that when x goes up by 1, y goes down 2 places, or by 2. x goes up by 1, y goes down by 2. So if x is increasing by five, that means y is decreasing by 10. In fact, the negative one here has nothing to do with it at all. If we're just talking about x changing in a, in a sort of by, by a particular quantity, y will change accordingly, but multiplied by uh, whatever the gradient is, okay? So the answer is 10. Now, just for, for your benefit, if you just wanna see this a different way, uh, you could actually do a table of values, in fact, and, and you could probably see this um, fairly quickly, in fact. So x, y, and uh, let's try some values here. So 0, 5, and 10. And we can use uh, substitution here. So when x equals 0, substituting it into the original formula here, uh, negative 1 minus 0 uh, is negative 1. When x equals 5, Okay, so we have negative 1 minus 2 times 5, we get negative 11. Whoop, I'll just put that on the screen there. Yep, negative 11. Okay, and when x equals 10, we get negative 21. So x is going up by 5, y is going down by 10. So that's another way to be able to see the answer. Question 7. Which histogram best represents a data set that is positively skewed? So that's a distribution that has a, what well, we call a tail. So it, it seems to be sort of very long on one side of the distribution. So if you have a look at A, okay, the bulk of the distribution is on the left hand side, but there's a tail region on the right. Option B is the other way around. So you got the tail on the left, okay, so it sort of looks like that. And we don't want that because that's negatively skewed. So it really goes to sort of, goes by where the tail is or the position of the tail. C is somewhat symmetrical, okay, and D is sort of somewhat uniform. So it's option A. Question 10. A plumber charges a call-out fee of $90 as well as $2 per minute while working. Suppose the plumber works for T hours. 
which equation expresses the amount the plumber charges, so that's C dollars, as a function of time, T hours. Now, go back, let's go back to the question. Plumber's charging $2 per minute. Now, but T's in hours. So we need to convert this $2 per minute, okay, per minute into dollars per hour. So there's 60 minutes, obviously, in an hour. So if we multiply that by 60, we end up with $120 per, per hour. Okay, so for every T, um, or every increase of T by one, so an extra hour work, it's an extra $120, okay? So looking at the options there, uh, we're charging $90, so that's just a, an upfront charge, so it's gonna be 90 plus something, okay? So 90, this 90 is not dependent on the amount of time that the plumber works, so the 90 and the T cannot be together. So it can't be A, and it can't be C. Now, look, let's look at option B, 90 plus 2T, uh, T's in hours. So if the plumber works one hour, uh, the plumber charges then $2. So that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but we've done some work previously um, to show that $2 per minute is really the equivalent of 120 per hour, and that leaves us option D as our only viable option, in fact, the, the correct option, okay? Question 12. For a set of bivariate data, Pearson's correlation coefficient is negative one. Which graph could best represent this set of bivariate data? Now, it helps to know some of your correlation coefficients. Correlation coefficient of zero means no correlation whatsoever, and it looks like a cloud of dots. But when there's a pattern there, if it's an upward trend, it's a positive number for the correlation coefficient. If it's a downward trend, then it's a negative number. So given that it's negative one, and negative one is the absolute sort of least um, in terms of the number that it can be, and negative one implies a perfect negative correlation. In other words, all the, the points will lie on a straight line. And it looks like op option D is the perfect candidate. And option D, it is. Now just quickly, option C would be a correlation coefficient of positive one. Option B would probably be around, probably 0 0.75, negative 0 0.75, actually, because it's downward. And A would probably be positive 0 0.75, so moderate to, to strong, okay? So anyways, answer is D. Question 14, an annuity consists of 10 payments each equal to $1,000. Each payment is made on the 30th of June each year from 2021 through to 2030 inclusive. The rate of compound interest is 5% per annum. The present value of the annuity is calculated at the 30th of June, 2020. The future value of the annuity is calculated at the 30th of June, 2030. Without performing any calculations, which of the following statements is true? Now, Future value of the annuity is calculated at 30th of June, 2030. There's our first clue. And that's the end of the investment, basically the investment um, term, right? So it's a 10 year term. So clearly the future value should be the greatest. In fact, logic would tell you so. So it can't be C and it can't be D because this is implying that the present value is in fact the largest or the, or the largest amount. Now the present value of the annuity is calculated at the 30th of June, 2020. So 30th of June, 2020, um, each payment is made on the 30th of June each year from 2021. So the present value of the annuity is actually nothing. It's actually the least. So it certainly can't be B, that's for sure, because $10,000 is the value of the principal or the amount invested over that 10 year period. After all, it's uh, it's $1,000, isn't it, per, per year. So it can't be B, logically. In fact, the only other option is A. Present value of the annuity, 30th of June, 2020, there's nothing in there, assuming that no, no um, you know, that there's no installments or, or no payments had been made. So starting from a zero bank account, uh, and then the first installment or the first um, in, or the first contribution of a thousand dollars does not occur until the year after. So A would have to be 
the answer there. And in fact, logically, it is the correct answer. Question 15. The top of a rectangular table is divided into eight equal sections as shown. A standard die with faces labelled 1 to 6 is rolled onto the table. The die is equally likely to land in any of the eight sections of the table. If the die does not land entirely in one section of the table, it is rolled again. A score is calculated by multiplying the values shown on the top face of the die by the number shown in the section of the table where the die lands. What is the probability of getting a score of 6? So first of all, we have a 1 on 8 chance that the die will land in any of these 8 squares. So which of the squares are we interested in? We want a score of 6, so whatever the whatever numbers on the, on the top of the die, multiply it by the number on, on the square that it lands, that's the score. So if we want a score of 6, okay, we need the die to land either here, okay, so we need to roll a 6 here, so I might just Okay, put a 6 there. We need it to land here, or that's one of the other options. We need to get a, a, a number 3 rolled on the die there. The die could land on the 3 square, but the die itself would have to have a 2 on it, since 2 times 3 is 6, obviously. 4 and 5 don't count. Well, we can't, we can't get 6 by multiplying um, the number on the die by 4 or 5. The only other one is 6. Okay, And we have to roll a 1 on the die there. So what's the probability in total? Now, the die is a, is a fair die, so you have an equal chance of, of rolling a one, two, three, four, five, or six on the die, and you've got an equal chance of also landing in one of these A squares. So in fact, we've got one, two, three, there's four probabilities here, okay? So it's, it's, one, it's like a multi-stage or a two-stage event here. There's four different, event, well, there's four different outcomes here that we're looking at. Okay, and well, multiplying those two together, okay, you have, let's say the die lands on the first square, we have a one in eight chance, okay, of landing there, times a one in six chance of rolling a six. Now, the same thing also occurs for square number two. You have a one on eight chance of, of landing there, multiplied by a one on six chance of rolling a three. And likewise with this square here and this square there. So we've actually got four of these basically equally likely outcomes of, of landing on a square and rolling a particular number. Okay? So, or, or that event, should I say, is probably the better word to use. The event of landing on a particular square and rolling a particular number. Okay? Now, multiplying all that together. Okay, so we'll make sure we do this properly. So one on eight. Okay, multiplied by one on six, and multiply that by four, and we get one on 12. Okay, so it's option B. The other way you can do this, okay, so is, is you can draw a tree diagram, perhaps. Okay, there's actually, you know, sort of that's the other way, I guess, and if there, maybe there might be other ways too, I don't know, but this is probably the, the easiest. If you want to do a tree diagram, you could do it this way. So one, I'll have to do it a little bit larger. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Each of these is a is a one eighth chance. Okay. These are the squares. Okay. One of the eight squares, and so on. Uh, now, there's only four that we're interested in. One, two, three, four. Okay, so and we, could, we need to either roll a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 6. 1, 2, 3. Now, you can see that drawing the tree diagram is, is going to be too messy. Now, that's one of the reasons why I just wanted to show you this, to think, well, if you've gone the tree diagram way, you'd probably hit a dead end at this point. And you probably think, no, nah, this is getting far too messy. You could probably do it, actually, and it is, there's enough space on this page to, to do the tree diagram. But I think it's far easier to think of it as, as a comp like a compound event or, or a compound sort of outcomes where you know the probability of landing on a square and you also know the probability of rolling a particular number and the two outcomes are multiplied together to give you the probability of that particular event.